Hi there, Banggood was kind enough to send me a radio for review. I was interested in this one because it's built around the S14732 chip, which is basically a complete communications receiver in a single chip. If you're interested, I leave a link to the radio in the description of this video. The radio itself is tiny and in a 3D printed case. The front is dominated by a screen and a single large knob that feels way out of proportion. There is a grill for a tiny speaker on the back. The top has an SMA connector for the antenna and a USB-C port. A single switch is barely accessible on the side and a 3.5mm earphone socket on the other. My radio came with this VIP antenna which extends from 15cm to 73cm or about 6 inches to 2.4 feet. This antenna is clearly optimized for FM radio. I've seen other antennas being sold for this radio which are better for AM reception. If you plug a USB charger in, there's a tiny charge light viewable through a hole on the bottom of the case. The only quote manual is this sheet glued to the packaging box. Everything is done using the encoder knob by rotation and single and double clicks. The bottom part warns that using earphones results in a very low volume and connection to an external speaker is recommended. Unsurprisingly, connecting two 4 ohm speakers to the 3.5mm socket does not work. I think the manual means an amplifier with speakers, not just speakers. AM reception in my area is very poor with lots of interference, but by connecting a long wire to the antenna and an earth wire, I did manage. Since the speaker is on the rear, the sound would be blocked when it's lying flat. On the other hand, with a VIP antenna extended, it's rather unstable when standing. So normally I use it lying down, but slightly propped up to avoid blocking the speaker. While the radio itself is rather capable, the user interface is pretty horrible. Once you select some function, you have to keep moving the encoder wheel to select the required option because if you stop moving for more than 2 seconds, the software times you out and throws you back to the top menu. This is not helped by the fact there are lots of parameters to play with, bands, bandwidth, SSB, gain control and so on. And the encoder is often skipping, so operation is very frustrating. I don't go into the details here because there is a better way. You have 20 bands to choose from, covering 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz and 64 megahertz to 108 megahertz. Of note, sometimes the bands overlap slightly, like here, where the 40 meter band goes to 7.3 megahertz and the next band, SW3, starts at 7.2 megahertz. In other cases, there are gaps, for example, SW8 ends at 18 MHz and the next band, 15 m, starts at 20 MHz. But not to worry, there is the OR band that covers the whole range from 150 kHz to 30 MHz in one go. If that's there, you may wonder why bother with bands. The reason is, there is no way to dial in a frequency directly. All you can do is to go up and down sequentially. You can, as you saw, go up or down automatically using the seek function or do it manually with the encoder wheel. The step size is changeable but still is rather tiring. The last band is called VHF and it includes the FM broadcast band. The FM reception and the sound quality and volume from that tiny speaker are astonishingly good. This is by the way the maximum volume recorded by the camera mic and it's almost too loud to just listen in a room. The RDS has decoded the station name. I only play short samples to avoid content matches. For further testing, I use my Marconi Signal Generator 2019A here, set to 27.84125 MHz and 50% AM modulation, using the internal 1 kHz test tone. The output is very low and loosely coupled to the VIP antenna. The frequency accuracy of the Signal Generator is quite good, just 1.3 Hz low. This is the radio receiving my Signal Generator. 
I connected an oscilloscope to the 3.5mm socket. Plugging the connector in turns the built-in speaker off. Both channels are basically on top of each other. The frequency of the test tone is about 1kHz with a level of about 100mV RMS. If I put a 1K resistor across one of the channels, in this case channel 2 with a yellow trace, the output level drops to about half. This means the output impedance of the radio is about 1K. No wonder that low ohm earphones or speakers are very soft or do not work at all. When tuning the radio slightly below and above the signal generator frequency, I noticed that the tuning range does not appear symmetrically around the target frequency. What I mean is that the signal fades by just going like 2 kHz below the target frequency, but I can still receive the signal going like 5 kHz above. This may indicate that the displayed frequency is actually a little higher than what the radio is actually tuned to. By the way, you notice another annoying user interface fact. Even tuning at the smallest step size of 1, the radio still mutes briefly at every step. To be more exact, I tried the same with my TM3B millivolt meter connected to the output. When tuned to the target frequency of 27.841 MHz, the level is a tad over 100 millivolts. That level stays basically the same all the way to 27.846, that is 5 steps above the target. At 24.847 it drops to 60 millivolts. Going the other way, just tuning down one step from the target already shows a small reduction and after two steps the signal is down to almost half. Assuming that the drop of the signal level is symmetric around the target frequency, this would indicate that the shown frequency is about 2 kHz too high. Maybe there is a clock oscillator somewhere that could be tweaked, so let's open it up. The case is held closed with four tiny self-topper screws that need a hex bit to open. You really have to wonder why they use a 3D printed case. I would have assumed at production level quantities a custom injection molded case would be cheaper, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, here we go. The rear contains an 800mA lithium battery and the speaker, while everything else is in the front part. The whole radio part is this chip, the SI14732, and while there is an oscillator it does not appear to be easily tuned. There is a comparatively massive ESP32-S3 chip that runs the whole show. It even has a Bluetooth antenna, but that doesn't seem to be enabled. This is the MCN16R8, which means it has 16 megabytes of flash memory. There is the usual charge controller for the battery and an audio amplifier chip. Interestingly, there are two buttons, labeled boot and reset, which I have to admit I forgot to try out. Because, fed up with the user interface, I was looking for alternatives and I found that someone has actually written new firmware. The instructions on how to do it are well described in this YouTube video from OM0ET. I don't want to repeat what he did so well and therefore I simply refer you to this video. I will add the link in the description of this video. In addition to the firmware update, his video shows that the reception can be improved using a small one transistor pre-amplifier or rather it provides a better impedance match to the VIP antenna for the AM part of the radio. I may do this eventually but so far I lack the time. The firmware can be downloaded here. I use 1.01 which was the latest available. One note. The radio's USB interface does not show as a normal serial port, but as an abstract control model or ACM device which is easily discovered in Linux. You see here that the device name is TTYACM0 and not a TTYUSBX and the product name is USB JTAG Serial Debug Unit. A similar happens in Windows and here is where I ran into trouble with Windows 7. You need special USB JTAG drivers and a flash download tool assumes they are already installed. In Windows 10, these are automatically installed when plugging the radio in for the first time. No such luck with Windows 7. You can of course use Linux anyway, but it appears you have to install the whole Expressive toolchain, IDE and whatnot. 
This is fine if you are planning to develop using these chips anyway, but for just a firmware update it's way easier and faster to just borrow a Windows 10 laptop. With the new firmware you get this boot screen and the layout of the display is very different. Instead of the frequency scale at the bottom you now have a proper S meter. The battery voltage is displayed and there's a clock but that basically restarts at zero when powered on. The left of the two circles in the top bar shows green every time the display is updated. The right one shows red whenever the flash memory is written. The idea here is not to turn the power off in the middle of a write. The user interface is now flat. Just one click is needed and by default volume is selected. Also the timeout is now 15 seconds. It's just marvelous what a difference this makes in operating the radio and I highly recommend changing the firmware. As Dave writes in his GitHub page, you should first save the old firmware because it appears that some radios have slightly different hardware. That way you can go back if you need it. He wrote a procedure for that which is easy to do. Once the new firmware is running, the USB port can be used for remote control. You set up a normal terminal program on the COM port or here in Linux on the ACM port, speed 115200 and you get a regular update of all parameters of the radio starting with the firmware version, current frequency, band, mode, bandwidth and so on. Details on how this is encoded are in Dave's firmware documentation PDF. Besides the remote monitoring, there are also some remote control commands. They work by simply sending single characters over the serial port to the radio. The commands in 1.01 .01 are shown here. This is great stuff. I hope this will eventually be expanded to allow setting frequencies directly instead of the band and up down buttons. For now I can send up and down commands, notice that the radio no longer mutes when doing this. Changing mode, changing band, changing volume, changing backlight intensity which is something that wasn't possible in the old firmware. Just for fun, let's do another verification of the frequency accuracy. I've set the signal generator to 27.841 MHz and no modulation. If I set the radio to 27.840 and upper sideband mode, I should get a 1 kHz tone. I do get a tone, but it sounds way higher than 1 kHz. In fact, when looking at the scope, it's 3.9 kHz and I actually have to set the bandwidth to 4 kHz to be able to hear it at all. This is clear proof that the display of 27.840 is not true and my radio is tuned about 2.9 kHz lower than what it shows. The new firmware in SSB mode allows a much finer frequency adjustment, basically as a replacement for the BFO, so when selecting step I can now go down to 10 Hz. Let's see how much I have to increase the tuning until the beat frequency is down to 1 kHz as it should be. I use the scope to see the audio frequency. By the way, the sound you hear is because the radio is also connected to a little amplifier and speaker. Anyway, there you are, about 2.89 kHz extra was needed to get the radio to tune to actually 27.840. If that is confusing, maybe this will help. If a radio station was sending a 1 kHz tone on 27.840, it actually creates a spectrum that contains the carrier at 27.840 and an upper sideband or USB at 27.840 plus 1 kHz, that is 27.841, and a lower sideband or LSB of 27.840 minus 1 kHz or 27.839. In single sideband or SSB mode only either the upper or lower sideband is transmitted and the actual carrier and other sideband are suppressed. I can simulate a transmitter at 27.840 with an upper sideband transmission of 1 kHz by sending an unmodulated carrier at 27.841. 
a correctly tuned receiver on 27.840 MHz in USB mode will therefore produce a beat frequency of 1 kHz, which you hear as a tone. In my radio, it turns out that the beat frequency is about 3.9 kHz instead. This means, although the radio display shows that it's tuned to 27.840 MHz, it in reality receiving on 27.8371 MHz, which results in the observed tone. To get the correct tone, I need to change the frequency to which the radio is tuned. It turns out that when the radio displays a frequency of 27.84289 MHz, the tone is close to 1 kHz. This means when my radio displays 27.84289, it is really receiving at 27.840. Just to be clear, this is a problem of my particular radio. Yours may be much more accurate or worse. To get the frequency tuning right is quite important for SSB and to cater for the inevitable tolerances of non-adjustable oscillators, the new firmware offers a calibration. Basically, this allows storing an offset that will be automatically applied to the tuning. Unfortunately, it's currently limited to a maximum of plus minus 2 kHz and I need, as we have seen, 2.89 kHz. I hope that future firmware versions will expand the calibration range. I hope you enjoyed this excursion into radios as much as I did. Despite the small frequency offset, this little inexpensive radio is very capable and definitely a lot of fun once you change the firmware, which is really easy to do. If you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up and it would be great if you decided supporting this channel by becoming a Patreon. Thanks for watching.